Chapter One of Murder Madness. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Richard Kilmer. Murder Madness by Murray Leinster. Chapter One. The engines of the Almirante Gomez were going dead slow. Away up beside her monster funnels, her siren blew dismally, Woo! and was silent for the regulation period, and blew desolately again into the clinging gray mist that ringed her all about. Her decks were wet and glistening. Droplets of water stood upon the deck stanchions, and dripped from the outer edge of the roof above the promenade deck. A thing swirling fog lay soggily upon the water, and the big steamer went dead slow upon her course, sending dismal and depressing blasts from her horn from time to time. It was barely possible to see from one side of the ship to the other. It was surely impossible to see the bow from a point half astern. Charlie Bell went forward along the promenade deck. He passed Senor Ortiz, ex-minister of the interior of the Argentine Republic. Ortiz bowed to him punctiliously, but Bell had a sudden impression that the Argentine's face was gray and ghastly. He checked himself and looked back. The little man was climbing the companion ladder toward the wireless room. Bell slipped on toward the bow. He did not want to give an impression of furtiveness, but the Almirante Gomez was twelve days out of New York and Bell was still entirely ignorant of why he was on board. He had been called into the office of his chief in the State Department and told curtly that his request for leave of absence had been granted, and Bell had not asked for a leave of absence. But at just that moment he saw a rubber band on the desk of his immediate superior, a fairly thick rubber band which had been tied into a certain intricate knot, and Bell had kept quiet. He went to his apartment, found his bags packed, and tickets to Rio via the Almirante Gomez in an envelope on his dressing table, and went out and caught a train to the ship. And that was all he knew. The siren up above blared dolefully into the fog. It was damp and soggy and depressing. The other passengers were under cover, and the decks seemed to be deserted. From the salon came the sound of music. Bell pulled up the collar of his light topcoat about his throat and strolled on toward the bow. He faced a row of steamer chairs. There was a figure curled up in one of them. Paula Canaleus, muffled up against the dampness and staring somberly out into the mist. Bell had met her in Washington and liked her a great deal, but he swore softly at the sight of her in his way. The afternoon before, he had seen a stoker on the Almirante Gomez pick up a bit of rope and absently tie knots in it while he exchanged Rabelaisian humor with his fellows. He had not looked at Bell at all, but the knots he tied were the same that Bell had last seen tied in a rubber band on the desk in the State Department in Washington, and Bell knew a recognition signal when he saw one. The stoker would be off watch just now, and by all the rules of reason, he ought to be out there on the forecastle, waiting for Bell to turn up and receive instructions. But Bell paused, lit a cigarette carefully, and strolled forward. Mr. Bell? He stopped and beamed fatuitously at her. It would have been logical for him to fall in love with her, and it is always desirable to seem logical. He had striven painstakingly to give the impression that he had fallen in love with her, and then had striven even more painstakingly to keep from doing it. Hello, he said in bland surprise. What are you doing out on deck? Brown eyes regarded him speculatively. Thinking, she said succinctly, about you, Mr. Bell. Bell beamed. Thinking, he confided, is usually a bad habit especially in a girl. But if you must think, I approve of your choice of subjects. 
What were you thinking about me? The brown eyes regarded him still more speculatively. I was wondering, said Paula, glancing to either side, I was wondering if you happen to be a, a member of the United States Secret Service. Bell laughed with entire naturalness. Good Lord, no, he said amusedly. I have a desk in the State Department building. I read counselor reports all day long and write letters bedeviling the councils for not including unavailable statistics in their communications. That's my work. I'm on leave now. She looked skeptical and, it may be, disappointed. You look as if you didn't believe me, said Bell, smiling. I give you my word of honor. I'm not a member of the United States Secret Service. Will that do to relieve your suspicions? I believe you, she said slowly, but it does not relieve my mind. I shall think about other people. I have something important to tell a member of the United States Secret Service. Bell shrugged. I'm sorry, he said amiably, but I can't oblige you by tipping one of them off. That's what you wanted me to do, isn't it? She nodded, and the gesture was very much like a dismissal. Bell frowned, hesitated, and went on. He was anxious to meet the stoker, but this... The siren droned dismally over his head. Fog lay deep about the ship. The washing of the waves and dripping of water on the decks was depressing. It seemed to be getting thicker. Four stanchions ahead, the mist was noticeable. He found that he could count five, six, seven. The eighth was indefinite. But a bar materialized in the fog before him, and the grayness drew away before him and closed in behind. When he was at the forward end of the promenade, looking down upon the forecastle deck, he was isolated. He heard footsteps some distance overhead. The watch officer up on the bridge. Bell glanced up and saw him as an indistinct figure. He waited until the officer paced over to the opposite side of the bridge. The air throbbed and shook with the roaring of the siren. Bell slipped over the edge of the rail and swung swiftly down the little ladder of iron bars set into the ship's structure. In seconds he had landed, and was down upon that terra incognita of all passengers, the deck reserved for the use of the crew. A mast loomed overhead, with its heavy, clumsy, derrick booms. A winch was by his side. Ottomans of deck machinery, inexplicable to a landsman, formed themselves vaguely in the mist. The fog was thicker, naturally, since the deck was closer to the water's edge. Hey, growled a voice close beside him. Passengers ain't allowed down here. An unshaven, soot-smeared figure loomed up. Bell could not see the man, save as a blur in the mist, but he said cheerfully, I know it, but I wanted to look. Seafaring's a trade I'd like to know something about. The figure grunted. Bell had just given his word of honor that he wasn't a member of the Secret Service. He wasn't but he was in the trade, which has no official existence anywhere, and the use of the word in his first remark was a recognition signal. What is your trade anyways, growled the figure skeptically. I sharpen serpent's teeth from time to time, offered Bell amiably. He recognized the man suddenly. Hello, Jameson, you look like the devil. Jameson drew nearer. He grunted softly. I know it. Listen closely, Bell. Your job is getting some information from Canaleus, Minister of War in Rio. He sent word up to Washington that he'd something important to say. It isn't treachery to Brazil because he's a decent man. Seven Secret Service men have disappeared in South America within three months. They found the eighth, and he's crazy. Something has driven him mad, and they say it's a devilish poison. He's a homicidal maniac, returning to the United States in a straitjacket. Canaleus knows what's happened to the Secret Service men. He said so, and he's going to tell us. His daughter brought the news to Washington, and then instead of going on to Europe, as she was supposed to do, 
She started back to Rio. You've got to get this information and pass it on to me. Then try to keep your skin whole and act innocent. You were picked out because, as a State Department man, hell could be raised if you vanished. Understand? Bell nodded. Something horrible is going on. Secret Service can't do anything. The man in Asuncion isn't dead. He's been seen, but he's cut loose. And servicemen don't often do that. He don't report. This means the service code may have been turned over and hell to pay generally. It's up to the trade. I've got it, said Bell. Here are two items for you. Miss Canaleas just said she suspected I was Secret Service. I convinced her I wasn't. She says she has important information for a serviceman. The brawny figure of the stoker growled. Damn woman! She was told somebody would be sent to see her father. She was shown a recognition knot with the outsider's variation, given one for father. That'll identify you to him. But she shouldn't have talked. Now be careful. As nearly as we know, the chap in the straitjacket was given some poison that drove him insane. There are hellish drugs down there. Maybe the same thing happened to the others. Look out for yourself and give me the information Canaleas gives you as quickly as God will let you. If anything happens to you, we want the stuff to get back. Understand? Of course, said Bell. He carefully did not shiver as he realized what Jameson meant by anything happening to him. The other item is that Ortiz ex-minister of the interior of the Argentine, is scared to death about something, sending radios right and left. Huh, growled Jameson. One of our men vanished in Buenos Aires. Watch him. You're friendly? Yes. Get friendlier. See what he's got. Now, shoo. Bell swung up the ladder again. Mist opened before him and closed again behind. He climbed over the rail to the promenade deck, and felt a little flare of irritation. There was a figure watching him. He slipped to the deck and grinned sheepishly at Paula Canaleas. She stood with her hands in the pockets of her little sport coat, regarding him very gravely. I suppose, said Charlie Bell sheepishly, that I look like a fool, but I've always wanted to climb up and down that ladder. I suppose it's a survival from the age of childhood. At the age of seven, I long to be a fireman. I wonder, said Paula quietly, Mr. Bell. She stepped close to him. I am taking a desperate chance. For the sake of my father, I wish certain things known. I think that you are an honorable man, and I think that you lied to me just now. Go and see Senor Ortiz. Your government will want to know what happens to him. Go and see him quickly. Bell felt the same flare of irritation as before. Women do not follow rules. They will not follow rules. They depend upon intuition, which is sometimes right, but sometimes leads to ungodly errors. Paula was right this time, but she could have been wholly and hopelessly wrong if she had talked to anyone else. My child, said Bell paternally, he was at least two years older than Paula. You should be careful. I did not lie to you just now. I am not Secret Service. But I happen to know that you have a tiny piece of string to give your father, and I beg of you not to show that to anyone else. And, well, you are probably watched. You must not talk seriously to me. He lifted his hat and started astern. He was more than merely irritated. He was almost frightened. Because the trade, officially, does not exist at all, and everybody in the trade is working entirely on his own. And because those people who suspect that there is a trade and dislike it are not on their own and have plenty of resources behind them, and yet it is requisite that the trade shall succeed in its various missions, always. The government of the United States, you understand, will admit that it has a secret service which it strives to identify solely with the pursuit of counterfeiters, postal thieves, 
and violators of the prohibition laws. Strongly pressed, it will admit that some members of the Secret Service work abroad, the official explanation being that they work abroad to forestall smugglers, and at a pinch, and in confidence, it may concede the existence of diplomatic secret agents. But there is no such thing as the trade. Not at all. The funds which members of the trade expend are derived by very devious bookkeeping from the appropriations allotted to an otherwise honestly conducted Department of the United States Government. Therefore the trade does not really exist. You might say that there is a sort of conspiracy among certain people to do certain things. Some of them are government officials, major and minor. Some of them are private citizens, reputable and otherwise. One or two of them are in jail, both here and abroad. But as far as the government of the United States is concerned, certain fortunate coincidences that happen now and then are purely coincidences and the trade which arranges for them does not exist, but it has a good many enemies. The foghorn howled dismally overhead. Mist swirled past the ship, and an oily swell surged vaguely overside, and disappeared into a gray oblivion half a ship's length away. Bell moved on toward the stern. It was his intention to go into the smoking room and idle ostentatiously, perhaps he would enter into another argument with that Brazilian air pilot who had so much confidence in Hanley Page wing slots. Bell had, in Washington, a small private plane that, he explained, had been given him by a wealthy aunt who hoped he would break his neck in it. He considered that wing slots interfered with stunting. He had picked out the door with his eyes when he espied a small figure standing by the rail. It was Ortiz, the Argentine ex-cabinet minister, staring off into the grayness and seeming to listen with all his ears. Bell slowed up. The little stout man turned and nodded to him, and then put out his hand. Senor Bell, he said quietly, tell me, do you hear airplane motors? Bell listened. The drip, drip, drip of condensed mist, the shuddering of the ship, with her motors going dead slow, the tinkling muted notes of the piano inside the salon, the washing and hissing of the waves overside. That was all. Why, no, said Bell, I don't. Sound travels freakishly in fog, though. One might be quite close, and we couldn't hear it. But we're a hundred and fifty miles off the Venezuelan coast, aren't we? Ortiz turned and faced him. Bell was shocked at the expression on the small man's face. It was drained of all blood, and its look was ghastly. But the rather fine dark eyes were steady. We are, agreed Ortiz, very steadily indeed. But I have received a radiogram that some airplane should fly near this ship, and it would amuse me to hear it. Bell frowned at the fog. I've done a good bit of flying, he observed, and if I were flying out to sea right now, I'd dodge this fog bank. It would be practically suicide to try to alight in a mist like this. Ortiz regarded him carefully. It seemed to Bell that sweat was coming out upon the other man's forehead. You mean, he said quietly, that an airplane could not land? It might try, said Bell with a shrug, but you couldn't judge your height above the water. You might crash right into it and dive under. Matter of fact, you probably would. Ortiz's nostrils quivered a little. I told them, he said steadily, I told them it was not wise to risk. He stopped. He looked suddenly at his hands, clenched upon the rail. A death of pallor, even greater than his previous terrible paleness, seemed to leave even his lips without blood. He wavered on his feet as if he were staggering. You're sick, said Bell sharply. Instinctively, he moved forward. The fine, dark eyes regarded him oddly. And Ortiz suddenly took his hands from the railing of the promenade deck. He looked at his fingers detachedly. 
and Bell could see them writhing, opening and closing in a horribly sensate fashion, as if they were possessed of devils and altogether beyond the control of their owner. And he suddenly realized that the steady grim regard with which Ortiz had looked at his hands was exactly like the look he had seen upon a man's face once when the man saw a venomous snake crawling toward him and had absolutely no weapon. Ortiz was looking at his fingers as a man might look at cobras at the ends of his wrists, very calmly, but with a still, stunned horror. He lifted his eyes to Bell. I have no control over them, he said quietly. My hands are useless to me. Senor Bell, I wonder if you would be good enough to assist me to my cabin. Again that deadly pallor flashed across his face. Bell caught at his arm. What is the matter, he demanded anxiously. Of course I will help you. Ortiz smiled very faintly. If any airplane arrives in time, he said steadily, something may be done. But you have rid me of even that hope. I have been poisoned, Senor Bell. But the ship's doctor. Ortiz, walking rather stiffly beside Bell, shrugged. He can do nothing. Will you be good enough to open this door for me? And his voice was hoarse for an instant. Assist me to put my hands in my pockets. I cannot, but I would not like them to be seen. Bell took hold of the writhing fingers. He saw sweat standing out upon Ortiz's forehead, and the fingers closed savagely upon Bell's hands, tearing at them. Ortiz looked at him with ghastly supplication. Now, he said, with difficulty, if you will open the door, Senor Bell. Bell slid the door aside. They went in together. People were making the best of boresome weather within, frankly yawning, most of them, but the card room would be full and the smoking room steward would be busy. My cabin is upon the next deck below, said Ortiz through stiff lips. We will descend the stairs. Bell went with him his face expressionless. My cabin should be unlocked, said Ortiz. It was. Ortiz entered, and with his hands still in his pockets, indicated a steamer trunk. Please open that, he licked his lips. I had thought I would have warning enough. It had not been so severe before. Right at the top. Bell flung the top back. A pair of bright and shiny handcuffs lay on top of a dress shirt. Yes, said Ortiz, steady. Put them upon my wrists, please. The poison that has been given to me is peculiar. I believe that one of your compatriots has experienced its effects. Bell started slightly. Ortiz eyed him steadily. Precisely. Ortiz's face, a gray mask of horror, spoke with a steadiness Bell could never have accomplished. A poison, Senor Bell, which has made a member of the Secret Service of the United States a homicidal maniac. It has been given to me. I have been hoping for its antidote. But quick, Senor Bell, quick, the handcuffs. End of Chapter One